Juan Pablo Tosar is from the University of the Republic of Uruguay and Institute Montevideo. He has been studying extracellular transfer RNAs for quite a while and his, has shown that tRNAs that are in circulation are not so much selectively exported there, but the ones that are there are what remain after interaction with RNAs in, in circulation, the, the stable dimers. And so that's an important paradigm for understanding what RNAs are present in circulation. And he's going to tell us today about the next phase of his work. And I'm looking forward, like you, to hearing about it. Let me just say that uh, please put questions in the chat during the talk, and we'll ask those first at the end. And as we have time, we'll open it up for audio questions. Juan, we look forward to hearing about the next phase of, the, of your work. Excellent. Thanks, Roger, for the introduction and also for the invitation. And actually, my second time presenting in these ERCC webinars. So if you have attended the past presentation, uh, this will be a different work that I'm presenting today, but there might be some shared slides in, in the introduction. And I will also be attending ERCC 19 in May. So if you're attending, we can continue discussion in person. The work I'm mostly going to talk today is about paper that we published in PNAS in January, Nick Tierney's of stable reservoirs of turning halves in cells and biofluids. But the outline of today's talk, I will try to convince you first that TRNA fragments, TDRs, are awesome and they do a lot of interesting things and that they are abundant in the exosol space and in biofluids. So maybe we use as disease biomarkers, etc. But then we will ask whether they actually exist. But, and the answer is yes, but often not in the way that we thought. And we will end with some Asian green Greek philosophy. So tyranny fragments have been described more than 10 years ago uh, in a variety of organisms. And our lab was among the labs that first described these tyranny fragments in parasitic uh, protozoa work from Maria Rosa Garcia. And during this decade, they had the many research groups have shown that different tRNA fragments, the most famous ones, I will say, are tRNA halves, which are produced when ribonuclease is cleaved tRNAs by the anticon at the anticon loop, producing a five prime and a three prime tRNA half. And there are a lot of functions that have been postulated and demonstrated for different tRNA fragments. And today I will only focus on one as an example, and it's their contribution to epigenetic inheritance. And a series of papers done in, in, with mice, with mice sperm. And these are just a few, there are others. Several research groups shown that changes in paternal diet or in different paternal traits, acquired traits, change the uh, small, RNA, small RNA content of mice sperm. And there is an upregulation of 5 prime tRNA halves. And this has been linked to the repression of genes under retrotransposon control in the embryos. And this is an example of non-Mendelian inherited metabolic changes in the progeny. So we can say that if uh, Lamarck lived today, he probably will be happy to see that at least there are some cases, examples in mammals where acquired paternal traits can be transmitted to the progeny, but this only lasts in principle for one generation, at least in, in mammals. And I will also like to briefly mention this paper that was published two weeks ago. It's part of work from Pablo Strobel's lab in Argentina that we have contributed in a little part, but it's mostly San Pablo's work. This is done in fish, in medaca fish, and what they did is to treat the male fish with methotexate, which is a drug that is used for arthritis and it's known to, to cause abortion. So women seeking to, to have children, they cannot have this drug, but the effects were not, have not been tested in males. And so they treat the male fish with this drug and look at the embryos and they observed that embryos from male fish treated with the drug had defects. And so, for example, shortening of certain uh, cartilage, and then they 
found they, they did small RNA seq and found and Mauricio Castellano in our lab contributed to this that there's an upregulation regulation of PRNA fragments in the sperm of treated fish. And when they purified these small RNAs from sperm, from treated and non-treated fish and micro-injected these small RNAs in embryos, they could recapitulate the effects that, that were observed after, that were observed in the embryos from fathers treated with the drug. So this is an example in this case in fish that paternal acquired traits can give rise to a reprogramming of the small RNA content in sperm, and that can induce changes, can induce changes in the embryos. And regarding tRNA fragments in the exosome space, there have been a lot of sequencing studies. This is just an example. But here you can see that in human serum, there's an important population of tRNA fragments, which is absent in plasma. And the reason the tRNA fragments are present in serum and not in plasma is related to the presence of the EDA. So plasma is usually obtained in the presence of EDA. And if you take out magnesium from the biofluid, then these tRNA halves disappear. If the plasma is obtained with heparin as an anticoagulant, then they are there. So there are a lot of tRNA fragments of tRNA halves in human biofluids. Uh, this is another, this is from an ERCC flagship uh, paper that was published in 2019. And here they found that in human serum and also in different biofluids, the most abundant tRNA derived fragments were generated from tRNA glycine and tRNA glutamic acid, and they had a length of 30, 31, 32, or 33 nucleotides. So they were five prime tRNA halves coming from glycine and glutamic acid tRNAs. And we did a study in salt culture, and we took the salt condition medium and pelleted it at 10,000 G to collect large EVs in red, uh, then 100,000 G centrifugation to collect small EVs in green, and then we took the supernatant, the 100,000 G supernatant, which we call the non-vesicular fraction. And actually, we observed that most of the RNA in the exosome space in this cell line, at least, was present in this non-vesicular fraction. And that was quite intriguing. And most of these non-vesicular tRNA, non-vesicular RNAs were tRNA fragments. And when sequencing these tRNA fragments inside cells, we could see a, an heterogeneous population. So fragments coming from different tRNAs and having different lengths. But in the non-vesicular fraction, they were mostly five prime halves, 30 or 31 nucleotides coming from tRNA glycine or tRNA glutamic acid. So we will say that, and there are other studies from other groups which observe similar things. So tRNA fragments in the exosome space seem to come in two flavors. So they are mainly fibrin halves of glutamic acid or tRNA glycine. And to us, that was quite intriguing. Why are these specific tRNA fragments so abundant in cell condition medium, in serum, in different biofluids? What's special about them? And especially considering that they are abundant in the non vesicular fraction, so they are not protected from extracellular RNAs by encapsulation in vesicles. So, how are non vesicular RNAs not being degraded by extracellular RNAs was a question that gave, gave, keep us awake at night. And then we realized it took us a couple of years to realize that these five prime tRNA halves from glycine can form homodimers. So they are self-complementary. And we show that these dimers are formed in vitro and that the dimers are much more resistant to degradation than the monomers. So if an RNA can dimerize, it forms a double-stranded RNA structure. And this structure is much more resistant to degradation. And also by the same time, uh, some one, one year before, the group of Fenov and Paul Anderson showed that tRNA halves coming from cysteine and alanine, and they showed before that these tRNA halves can inhibit translation initiation, that they don't work alone. They form tetramers, and these tetramers are stabilized by she quadruplex structures. So it seems to be a common feature of tRNA halves, their capacity to form oligomeric structures. and it is the structures, the structures are functional. So for example, in a later work, they show that these 
tetramers are in fact what interact with components of the translation machinery. So this is something to bear in mind and will be important for the rest of the talk. The structure matters and it matters a lot. So this was our observation. We observed that there was an enrichment of specific QNA halves in the exosphere space on those side vesicles. They were blue tamic acid QNA halves in blue or glycine QNA halves in red. And at the beginning, we thought this was an example of selective release. So the soft was somehow selecting this RNAs for releasing to the exosphere space. But considering this capacity of forming dimers, there was also an alternative possibility. And that possibility was that the soul was just releasing all the TRNA halves it had inside, and most of them will be degraded by exothermal ribonucleases. And then we will only be seeing those that are more stable, maybe because they form dimers. So we thought in well, maybe we should add ribonuclease inhibitor to the media and see whether we can stabilize this population of transient extracellular RNAs. And actually when we did that, the results were striking because we start observing a population of full length DRNAs. So this is an example, this is a northern blood because you cannot sequence full length DRNAs by standard sequencing techniques, but by northern blood, we could see these DRNA halves in the cell condition medium in the non vesicular fraction, but when we added drug nucleus inhibitor, now we started seeing full length urinates. And that means that the cell is releasing full length urinates, and then the urinates are being cleaved in the exosphere space to produce the urinate halves. So we have an extracellular biogenesis of urinate halves. And this was confirmed by an independent paper published by Tom Shinshaw's group at Cosby Harbor. In this case, they had cells which were knockout for RNAs1, and they look at the non the non vesicular fraction of the cell condition medium. And in wild type cells, they saw uh, TRA fragments, and in the mutant cells, now they had full length TRA. So, very results were both pointing in the same direction. And so, a concept which I think is important that is derived from these studies is that survivorship bias defines non vesicular XRNA profiles meaning that what we see, what we can observe, is usually not necessarily what the cell is releasing. We are missing part of the story because we don't have the ability to see what, what is happening. And what we are actually seeing are the RNAs that are resistant to degradation. And thanks, Roger, for mentioning this in your nice introduction. So then we wonder about what could be the biological function of these non-vesicular full-length DRNAs, if, if any. And to answer that, we realize that we need to understand the stability of these non-vesicular DRNAs uh, in human biophysics. Why? Because let's imagine that we have a group of cells, it could be cancer cells or normal cells, and they are releasing the full-length DRNAs into the central space somehow, maybe because they're die or by other mechanisms. If the TRNAs are rapidly degraded by extracellular RNAs, then we will expect that uh, the gradient of these molecules will be very small, meaning that these molecules won't be able to travel too far from the cells that are releasing these RNAs. In contrast, if the TRNAs are stable, they could travel longer distances, and maybe they could have the opportunity of interacting with different cells, like immune cells, for example. So this was work that was mostly done by Bruno Costa, but also by, by other excellent researchers that I'm lucky to work with. And what Bruno did was to purify RNA from cells and just incubated the purified RNA. So this is free from protein. This is naked RNA. He incubated the purified RNA with Eppendorf containing DMEM plus 10% petabomin serum to mimic conditions usually found in cell culture. And he incubated the RNA for different periods of time. So five minutes, 15, 45, 90. And in the presence of our ribonucleus inhibitor, you can see, for example, these bands by northern blood corresponding to different ribosomal RNAs. But in the absence of ribonucleus inhibitor, the ribosomal RNAs are degraded in less than a minute. So they are not here. But we were intrigued by these bands we could see in the gels. So what are these bands? They look like tRNAs. So we tried different we try proofs against different TRNAs, for example, TRNA glycine. TRNA glycine is again degraded in less than a minute. 
So it's not purine glycine. Then we found it. It's purine lysine, UU anticodon UUU. So you can see that purine lysine is completely stable in 10% fed above in serum. So we can still see it after 90 minutes at 37 degrees at input levels. So this means that there are striking difference, differences in exosome stability between RNA classes, but also within RNA biotypes. So some tRNAs are more stable than others. And is this something intrinsic from tRNA lysine? Or maybe what is happening here is that tRNA lysine is binding a protein in FBS, and that's how it is stabilized. So we are adding naked RNA, but maybe the RNA is still able of interacting with the protein from serum. So to study that, we repeated this experiment, but now incubating the naked RNA with recombinant human RNA one So there's no bifluid, there are no proteins beyond the ribonuclease. And we observe the same. So tRNA lysine is always more stable than tRNA glycine, than other tRNAs and other ribosomal RNAs, for, for example. So tRNA lysine is intrinsically stable. But a great thing about northern blood is that we can study simultaneously the full length RNA and the fragments that are produced from the fragmentation. So actually, if we look at the entire blood, we see that the tRNA glycine is degraded rapidly, the full length form, but the fragments which are produced from the fragmentation of this tRNA are very stable. So here you can see they have coming from glycine after two hours of incubation, which are ribonuclease one at 37 degrees. And then we tested this in human biofluids, so human urine, serum. So this is 10% serum, but we also try 100% serum and CSF. And it's always the same story. There are small differences between biofluids. So not all biofluids have the same RNA activity, but tRNA lysine is always more stable than tRNA glycine and than other RNAs like ribosomal RNAs or 7SL and many others. But the fragments of tRNA glycine are extremely stable. And we calculated the half-lives of different RNAs. In this case, I'm just showing what's happening in CSF. And you can see that ribosomal RNAs, they have a half-life of less than six seconds, released and gone. If they are released from a cell, here we are adding them. But if they are released from a cell, they will be gone very rapidly. In fact, ribosomal RNAs will be released in the context of ribosomes because we also showed that cells can release ribosomes and the half-life is higher in the context of a ribosome, but it's still very low. Full length tRNA lysine has a half-life of two minutes in CSF, but the fragments of tRNA glycine, the tRNA halves of 30 nucleotides, have lives of ha that are higher than two hours. And that's really impressive. It means that if a cell is releasing tRNA glycine, it will be cleaved by the anticodon, but then the fragments will be around in CF for two hours, maybe until a, micro, a cell that incorporates them or whatever. But then we did what at that time was a control. So let's do the uh, northern blood, not with a five prime proof, but with a, uh, with a proof against the three prime end of tRNA glycine. And even though sequencing results showed that only the five prime tRNA halves were present by northern blood, we could see that both the five prime and the three prime halves were present. And what's more striking is that the decay kinetics is virtually the same. So it looks like the five prime and the three prime halves, they behave the same. And this suggests that they are forming part of the same complex. And by observing these results, we wonder if we were getting the things correctly. Because we used to think that if we have a tRNA and our ribonuclease cleaves the tRNA at the anticodon loop, it will produce two tRNA halves that will spontaneously dissociate and they will have different fates. So the five prime and the three prime halves will have different fates. But what if when a ribonuclease cleaves a tRNA, it produces a nick tRNA? So the five prime and the three prime halves are stick together. And maybe we are forcing the separation of these NIC RNAs because most RNA extraction kits and small RNA seq protocols, which involve uh, heating, and northern blood, which involves running the RNA on denaturing gels, 
they all involve RNA denaturation steps. So maybe we are missing these molecules because we are destroying them. And so we try to find a way of studying, of identifying these new RNAs. And we remember a case which happens in an arms race between the T4 phage and Escherichia coli. So when the phage infects E. coli, recognizes the invading pathogen, and it activates a protein, which is called PRC, and PRC will clip the anticoron of TRNA lysine. And in that way, the bacteria tells the phage, you can no longer translate your proteins. But then the phage evolved two enzymes, which are T4 polynucleotide kinase, which they phosphorylate here because these anticholonucleases leave a three prime phosphate or three prime cyclic phosphate and a five prime OH. So T4 PNK will dephosphorylate here and phosphorylate the five prime OH into five prime phosphate. And then T4 RNA ligase one can ligate this NIC. So we all know these enzymes, they are widely used in molecular biology. But maybe what is less known is that the natural substrates of, substrates of these uh, enzymes are nicked tRNA bacteria. So maybe we could use these enzymes to prove the presence of nicked tRNAs in, in, in extrasolar samples and in human cells. So what Bruno did was just to take a purified RNA, so that's our input, and treat the RNA with RNA1 for an hour. And by northern blood, we can see a complete conversion of full length tRNAs into five prime tRNA halves as expected. So this is mimicking what, what is happening uh, in the exosphere space. And then if he, after degradation, if he treated the RNA with PNK plus RNA ligase one and both enzymes are needed, then he regenerated a band, and this is under the natural conditions, that runs exactly the same as a tRNA. But maybe we thought, Maybe this is a ligation in, in, in trans. Maybe we are ligating a five prime half and a three prime half together, but that's not the case because if you hit the RNA before the enzymatic cocktail, this repair protocol that it does not work. This means that the ligation is in cis, and this means that the five prime and the three prime halves are bound together in the form of an IC TRNA. And something that is interesting is for this protocol, for this repair protocol to work, the RNA needs to be purified under non denaturing conditions, and that can be obtained by solid phase extractions and silica columns. But if we use trisol or different methods which contain phenol and cotropications, this does not work. So if we purify RNA using denaturing conditions, you can no longer repair a need DRNAs. And I think that's something important to bear in mind. And we show this by a different way using native gels. So again, we have the input, full length tRNA band, but now this is a native gel. And if the input is treated with RNA1 for an hour, now we are no longer seeing five prime halves. We see a band that under native conditions migrates very similar to a full length tRNA. It's not the same because the CCA tail is lost, but it's roughly the same. But if the RNA is purified using trisol or mere RNA EC from cryogen or different methods, or if it is heated before solid phase extraction, then what you have are five prime halves, so single-stranded halves. So we really need non-denaturing purifying conditions to, to make this happen. What about the stability of NIC tRNAs compared to the single-stranded tRNA halves? So the same protocol had the input RNA treated with RNAs1 to generate the NIC tRNAs or the fragments. Well, now we know they are NIC tRNAs. And then we cleaned, we purified these, these nicked tRNAs by solid phase extraction and treated again with RNAs1. And we treat again with RNAs1 and we see no degradation, meaning that these nicked tRNAs are really stable against RNA family members. But if we hit the RNA before treating the second round of treatment with RNAs1, then the tRNA halves are gone. And this shows that nicked tRNAs are stable while single-stranded tRNA halves are not. What about the extracellular, sorry, what about the extracellular tRNA halves that we observed in the extracellular space? Are they NIC tRNAs or are they tRNA halves? And I think that they are mostly NIC tRNAs. 
And to show this, we took soil condition medium, purified EVs by chromatography using iron columns, and then took the non vesicular fractions, or so fractions five to eight in, in this case. And well, by northern blood, we can see we have the five prime tRNA halves here. We have a faint band corresponding to full length tRNAs because this is serum free, so the RNA content of the media is low, but mostly in the form of tRNA halves. But if we use these two enzymes, now we regenerate a band which is almost the size of a tRNA. If we hit the RNA before, this does not happen. So this means that at least a fraction of the tRNA halves that are present uh, in the excessive space are nick tRNAs. And I'm not showing this here, but this tRNA band is resistant to RNAs R. RNAs R is a highly processive ribonuclease that clips any RNA except those which are either circular or highly structured like tRNA. So this band is resistant while this band is not. What about intracellular tRNAs, tRNA halves? Are they nick tRNAs? And at least for glycine, the answer is probably yes. So here we did something different. We lysed cells and fractionated the intracellular RNA by size exclusion chromatography under native conditions for RNA. So we are performing a native separation which preserves RNA-RNA interactions. And so we look first ribosomal RNAs, and then we have the tRNA peak. And if we look by northern blood around the tRNA peak, we can see the full length tRNAs and the fragments. So the fragments are co purifying with the full length tRNAs under native conditions. Maybe we have fragments here and they are below the limit of detection of this northern blood. And so we use a more sensitive technique, which is qPCR. And by qPCR, this is a stem loop RT qPCR, which is specific for tRNA fragments. Uh, of course, we hit before the RNA. So if we have nick RNAs, they are behaving as fragments and they are only amplifying with the full length tRNAs. We see no amplification at these uh, higher fractions where, for example, microRNAs elute. If we hit the RNA before doing the size excretion chromatography, then we shift the tRNA halves and now they amplify in fraction six instead of fraction three, meaning that they are smaller. So heating is separating these nick tRNAs into tRNA halves. That's our interpretation. What about tRNA halves in biofluids? Are they tRNA halves or are they nick tRNAs? So this is a result in CSF, but we did the same in serum and urine. And we did something very similar. So we took the, in this case, the biofluid and spin it down at 100,000 G to have the non vesicular fraction. We treat that non vesicular fraction with proteinase K, get rid of protein. So we only have naked RNA there. And we injected the RNA in a size chromatography column. And we can see, again, amplification of tRNA halves in the region where we expect the elution of full length tRNAs and not where we expect the elution of single stranded tRNA halves. Regarding a potential function of these nick tRNAs, we consider the possibility whether cells could internalize these nick tRNAs, but that's complicated because they are double stranded RNA structures. But what we observed was that if we use synthetic single stranded tRNA halves containing a group, then and this was done by Marco Icalzi and Valentina Blanco, and they found that they could see the signal inside the cells using a streptavidin coupled to a fluorochrome or by qPCR. So single stranded RNAs tend to spontaneously enter cells if they can. And that's something that might seem striking, but there are a lot of biopharmaceuticals, which are oligo, single-stranded oligonucleotides, and they are known to enter cells by spontaneous endo endocytosis. So we think that maybe nick tRNAs will behave as a carrier of RNA. So they could work as carriers of tRNA halves in the exosome space, meaning that cells Either they die or they release full length tRNAs. These full length tRNAs will be, so will be cleared by extracellular ribonucleases represented here with scissors. But then we will have nick tRNAs that are very stable. So they are almost like full length tRNAs, but they have some clipped bonds. But, and these nick tRNAs might be able to travel longer distances and maybe in the vicinity of a cell, 
they can dissociate because there will be always be some spontaneous dissociation and the single stranded tyranny halves, they will be either degraded or may, they can be internalized by cells. And that's something that we are actively studying right now. And something that's important is that if we want to study these sneak tyrannies or if we want to sequence them, we need to repair using this protocol composed of first shooting with T4PNK and then T4RNA ligase one. And this tRNA repair is important if we want to study whether NIC tRNAs might function as disease biomarkers. And this is important because you cannot sequence NIC tRNAs using standard protocols. Because to sequence a tRNA, we need to reverse transcribe it first. And the reverse transcriptases cannot jump when they find at least the standard reverse transcriptases have a hard time in champing when they found this clipped font. Let's imagine that these enzymes are like this blue track here. And when they find this clipped site at the anticodon loop, it's like a broken bridge. They cannot pass. But if we treat the RNA with PNK and RNA ligase one or other enzymatic combinations, it's like that we are repairing the bridge and now they can reverse transcribe the full length tRNA. We show that by RT-PCR or qPCR. So we have the amplification of the full length tRNA. If we treat it with RNA1 for an hour, now we have the NIC tRNA and the amplification is much less efficient. But if we repair the NIC tRNA, now we can reverse transcribe it and amplify it. And here you can see that we are amplifying like 30% of the levels that we had in our input. So it's quite efficient. These are just my last, uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning that we'll talk a little bit about Greek philosophy and this, that's because I want you to remember Plato's allegory of the cave. You are probably familiarized with it. So we have some prisoners who always lived in this cave and they are only allowed to watch a wall in the cave. And in the wall, they can see the shadows of different objects that are happening behind them. And because these prisoners grew in the cave, they might think that these shadows are the actual things, are the actual reality. And Plato's invitations were, invitation was to try to grasp, look above and try to understand like higher orders of reality that in his mind was these higher orders of reality were related to mathematics and science in general. But we call present the smaller, sorry, the small RNA seq allegory of the allegory of the cave. So what we have are is a 4D dynamic structure space. So RNA lives in three dimensions, and it, the structure of the RNA can also change with time. So that's it's in 4D. And what we are seeing by sequencing is an unidimensional projection of this for the reality. And this unidimensional projection can be quite distant from what we really have. And I think that the case of Nick TRNAs being projected as five prime TRNA halves can be illustrative of this. What's important here is that sequencing is fantastic and gives a lot of information, but we really need biochemistry, structural biochemistry to make sense of sequencing data. And maybe that's not the case for microRNAs. But what happened with microRNAs is that if we look at the structures of arconid proteins open up the microRNAs and use microRNAs essentially as linear molecules. So microRNAs behave as linear molecules. So if we have the sequence, we can predict function. And we have a lot of target prediction algorithms that work at the sequence level. And that's fine because the biochemistry supports that mode of action. But if we look at many other RNAs, and here is the case of ribose, which uh, that senses uh, glutamine, here we can see that we can really not understand what's going on just based on sequence level information. We need to grasp what's happening at a structural level, at a biochemical level, to, to make sense of the sequence level information. That's mostly what I wanted to talk to get today. So much of this work was done in two lab, uh, my lab at the School of Science in the University of the Republic, and Alfonso Cachotti's lab at the Pasteur Institute of Montevideo. 
as you can see, they are one is next to the other. So we actually work as a merged group. And most of the results that I showed today were done by Bruno, uh, by uh, Mauricio, by Marco, by Valentina. But there are also lots of related projects in the lab that we might be uh, we might discuss, discuss in a future opportunity. I would also like to thank a lot to Ken Whitworth. Ken, we are par participating in the Exacerbate RNA Communication Consortium in association with Ken Whitworth's lab, Sean Hopkins, and Ken has been an excellent collaborator across the years. And we have also done this work on Nick Kearney's with uh, Pavel Ivanov at Harvard, and Pasha has done a lot of groundbreaking work understanding the function of tRNA hubs. What I showed earlier about Medaca fish is work done by Pablo Strobo in Argentina, and Irene Litvan has a collaboration related to the study of CSMs. And here are some e nice images of Uruguay. So now that the pandemic is either over or mostly over or finishing at least, and we can travel again, come to visit. Uruguay is a wonderful country to visit and also to do some science. So looking forward to having you around at some point. So thanks a lot. I will be attending ERCC 19, as I mentioned, so we can continue discussing there in person if you are attending too. And anyway, I think we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. That's fascinating as always. I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks at ERCC 19. My first question in chat is a little small focused. In your northern blot of the phage PNK digestion, where you showed that it repairs NICT 5 prime ends back to full length, why isn't there a three prime end band in that blot? Because doesn't that need to be there in order for the thing to recapitulate itself? If I understood correctly, you are asking if we do an order blot with a three prime proof, we see the same. Is that what you were asking? Yes. Yes, I have. It's, a, I, maybe it's me not understanding the biochemistry of the northern bots. Can you not assay them both at the same time in the same blood? Well, here you can see this if you look at the bottom. So this is this is very similar to what I shown. So NT is without repair. So the five prime halves RNA ligase one alone does not work. This is a mutant version of PNK, PNK plus RNA ligase one. It doesn't work. The two enzymes together, they generate the full length RNA. And if we hit, this doesn't work. And here we are looking the same, but now using a three prime proof. So here we are seeing three prime halves. And here we are seeing the same full length RNA. So if I understand correctly, if you have a full length RNA and you use a proof against a five prime half, you will see a band which corresponds to the full length RNA and the five prime halves. If you have the full length RNA and you use a proof against the three prime half, you will see the same band corresponding to the same full length RNA and, but now also the three prime halves here. So it's the same if you have a full length RNA, it's different if you have the fragments. Uh, and, and, and this is the same with a proof which is bridging at the anticodon. So in this case, we are not seeing the fragments because this proof which goes through the anticodon is not long enough to detect the halves, the five prime or the three prime halves alone. But after we repair, we see the same full length RNA band. Roger Innes's question is for the uptake assay, did you rule out association with the cell surface versus actual uptake? Yes. So Marco Licalzi has been working a lot in this recently. And yes, we are I don't have the videos with here with me right now, but if we have labeled RNAs, we can do lip cell imaging and we can track the RNAs. And we really see that they are endocytosed, endocytite, sorry. And, what, and they are incorporating the cell and they travel towards the cell interior. So in this case, we are just seeing a snapshot of the cell, but this is from focal microsco mic microscopy. So actually we know that these are inside the cells, but also by lip cell imaging, we can track individual, well, groups of RNA molecules as they are, as they travel 
in the cell. So yes, we are pretty sure that they are inside the cell and not necessarily in the surface. I want to take this opportunity to plug our workshop that's coming up. This work is exactly, the, this kind of work is exactly the focus of that molecular beacon workshop next month. Um, and on the same topic, at the end, you talked about it's very important, Plato's cave, it's very important to understand RNA structure. One of the speakers at that workshop, Jen Wang, is going to talk about methods for predicting and studying RNA 3D structures with like machine learning. And I think that kind of work is vital going forward. Um, we've been mapping RNA-seq data to annotated classes of RNA that we know from the cell for years, but there may be completely new classes of RNA with different structures that are only present extracellularly and we need to study that space. Let's see. Yeah, I completely agree with you. So Minu asks, have you tried to test whether these non-vesicular tRNAs in extracellular spaces or biofluids are associated with their complementary amino acids? Yeah, that's a great question. We have not tested that directly, but we consistently see, let me show you this. It will be somewhere around here. Here, for example, we consistently see that the repair tRNA band is shorter than the full length tRNA. And here, for example, and that how short it is depends on how long we treat with RNAs. If we treat short enough, the repair band is 67 nucleotides compared to 72 for the full length tRNA. So what we think is going on is that the tRNAs are losing the CD tail. And the CD tail, when it is, once it's split, it goes away. We, we cannot recover it. So I will say that even if the tRNAs are amino acylated when they are released from the cells, given that the CD tail is a, is a target of ribonucleases because it is single-stranded RNA, the amino acid will go out with the CCA tail. And in this other paper that was published in NAR in 2020 by a research group, they studied what happens with the tRNAs after treating with RNAs1, and they see by sequencing that the tRNAs now they, they end, they have this CATL loss. So that's an independent confirmation of that. So I, I don't know if the tRNAs are amino acylated when they are released from the cells. I don't know if that's the question. And what's the degree of amino acylation? We have not studied that, but after a while, they will lose the amino acid because they will lose the CCD. Uh, it's great to see Anna Kochevsky here. She asks, she says, thanks for the great talk and asks, do most other tRNA and tRNA halves, non-glycine GCC form NIC tRNAs extracellularly or within the cells? And if not, why? Yeah, hi Anna. And yes, we think that most of them do that. But what's special about glycine is that, so it's really a, it's really a stability problem. So you have the stability of the full length tRNAs. You have the stability of the NIC tRNAs. You have the stability of the tRNA halves because the tRNA halves can be stable. Again, for example, we've shown that some of them come from dimers and the dimerization is a way of stabilizing them. And what's special about glycine, we think, is that we have not tested any every tRNA, but we tested many. And the NIC, the NIC forms of the glycine tRNAs are very stable. And that probably has to do with the GC content of the anticodon stem. So if you have a NIC tRNA, but now the base pairing here is not very strong, that NIC tRNA will be flexible and then ribonucleases can cleave it further. And in the case of glycine tier, gly, of NIC forms of glycine tRNAs, they remain in this NIC conformation for longer periods of time. But we have found ways of stabilizing NIC tRNAs in general. And then by Northern blood, we start seeing a lot of other NIC tRNAs. So all these experiments were done under conditions that, because we didn't know that at that time, that are not the best for the stabilization of NIC tRNAs. So that's why we'll tend to see glycine. 
But if we add magnesium and other ions, and we can really stabilize nicotine we start seeing the same for many others. He, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. No, actually here we have an example because our proofs, our these proofs for the anticodon loop of glycine GCC also hybridized with a partic acid. And so actually when we repair that, we can see both bands, but we mostly see the repair of aspartic acid in this case. And if we use a proof against the five prime end of aspartic acid, we can see that we can repair it as well. So here is an example of another nicotine in this case, aspartic acid. BT Kasargam asks, can NICT tRNAs be responsible for forming supramolecules and could they be responsible for pathogenesis? Uh, what will be what will be a supramolecule formed by, by, by NICT tRNAs? So many NICT tRNAs being associated together to form like a big aggregate. I'm not sure about if I'm getting the concept correctly. I guess I, I could relate it to, you mentioned tRNAs forming G quadruplexes earlier. And if I, I see. that was just an example of the importance of structure, but we don't know of actual extracellular tRNAs aggregating in that fashion, do we? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And we don't know whether NIC tRNAs can associate to form like oligomers of NIC tRNAs. I'm, I don't think that we can either prove or discard that possibility with the type of assays that we are performing. In the case of full-length tRNAs, there are examples of, the, of so the tRNAs can have some association by the kissing loops by the anticode that has been described. So you, you can have some uh, interactions between full-length tRNAs, but I don't know if that happens, will happen with uh, NIC tRNA, but I will say that Yes, that's something that might be important to explore, definitely. Pablo Strobel says, great talk as usual. You are postulating the role of NIC tRNA as a Trojan horse to survive outside the cell and maybe enter into cells. And then half tRNA, half tRNA is the one having a role inside the cells. But is it possible that NIC tRNAs may also have a functionality on the target cells? Yes, that's an excellent question. And what uh, Valentina Blanco PhD work is about disentangling what's happening with the single stranded tyranny halves and, and the NIC tyranies. And yes, it's it's challenging because many of the techniques that we have to study uh, this phenomena, they involve denaturation steps. And once we denature, we lose the three-dimensional information and everything looks the same. We, it was very easy to show that the single-stranded tRNA halves can enter into the cells. But in the case of NIC tRNAs, it's more difficult because if we add a NIC tRNA to a cell and it is labeled, and then we see this the design inside the cell, are we sure that it entered as a NIC tRNA, or maybe it dissociated spontaneously and the tRNA has entered into the cell. So that's a very relevant question. And we are trying to have an answer for that question, but we still, we are still not there. Uh, one more question in chat from Roger Ines related to Pablo's question. Do NIC tRNAs get taken up faster than tRNA halves? Yeah, I'm afraid that, that I will have to provide the same answer. We're still not sure whether NIC tRNAs can enter the cell as such without prior dissociation into tRNA halves. Uh, we know that if they dissociate, the tRNA halves can enter into the cells, but whether the NIC tRNA can do that is something that we still don't know. And what about full length tRNAs? We really don't know whether full-length tRNAs can enter into the cell. So that's something that we'll need to study as well. If you go, I think there, there are some insights from what happened with many biopharmaceuticals. So many single-stranded oligonucleotides work and they don't need to be encapsulated. So they enter the cells by using endocytosis. But when it comes to uh, small interfering RNAs, which are double-stranded, then this route of like spontaneous endocytosis no longer works. And then 
you need to encapsulate the small interfering RNAs inside a lipid nanoparticle to have them inside the cells. So at some point, it, it might matter the amount of negative charges that are concentrated in a single-stranded versus a double-stranded molecule. And I want to see an RNA as a double-stranded molecule, because in fact, it is. But we cannot really say whether nick RNAs or full length RNAs are capable of entering cells as naked molecules. I can see a comment by Roger Rins that full length RNAs are taken up by mitochondria. That's very interesting. Yeah, that thanks for sharing that, that fact. It's very on spot. Thanks. Here we have another. Oh, let me just mention before we have another question. Let me just mention that I didn't mention this for the sake of time, but in the last month, several other papers that have been published and they all go in the same direction that many of what we used to see as TRNA hubs are actually unique TRNAs. And actually there's a lot of interesting biology that is starting to emerge. So, so I would like to mention this, these other papers, which I think they, they make a good combo together. So let's see, maybe we can answer one more question before the hour. Minu asks, can you comment on the modifications on the secreted tRNAs? Yeah, we have not uh, added modifications directly, and that's something that is needed to have a good interpretation of the data. But I can give an indirect answer to that. The fact that tRNA lysine is intrinsically stable, I think it's, uh, it's interesting because tRNA lysine has a massive modification in the anticoding loop. And maybe that there are a lot of modified bases, but tRNA lysine UUU has a really bulky one. So we think that maybe what's happening there is that the ribonucleases cannot reach the anticodon because of this modification. Of course, this is just an hypothesis, but if we try to prove tRNA lysine, which is proved against the anticodon, then we see no sign now. And that's probably because of this modification. The northern blood proof is not capable of hybridizing with the tRNA. So we really lack this level of knowledge that corresponds to RNA tRNA modifications. And there are some very uh, exciting new methods to have sequencing information with base modifications together. And that will really help to understand some many observations. Yeah, I think the space of RNA modifications is as dizzyingly complex as the space of histone modifications. And the fact that standard high throughput RNA sequencing misses most of that, people really need to keep that in mind. And um, yeah, so I, I think we've run out of time, but what a great discussion. Thanks very much, Juan, and looking forward to seeing you at ERCC 19. Okay, thanks a lot. And if you have any more questions, you can always reach me by email. So thanks everybody for watching and for the great questions.